From the Toronto Star, I'm Adrian Chung, and this matters. Among all the daily updates about COVID-19 this summer, there is actually some good news. A major milestone in the battle against COVID-19. For the first time in the U.S., Phase 3 vaccine trials are now getting underway. 30,000 Americans are expected to volunteer for Moderna vaccine clinical trials, hoping the vaccine will be the answer to defeating the coronavirus. We're not there yet, but advancements in ending COVID-19 through a vaccine are being made. We'll also see what this means for Canada. This week, Chief Public Health Officer Dr. Theresa Tam says the Canadian government is looking into different options, from pre-ordering vaccines to the possibility of more funding to manufacture them here. But before any vaccine exists, there are already questions about its distribution. More than 7.5 billion people live in the world. Best case scenario, the first batch will only have several million doses. So public health officials have to answer some big questions. Who should get the vaccine first? And who gets to make that decision? Our colleague Toronto Star reporter Alex Boyd in Calgary is reporting on these life and death debates and the many people who are working to find good answers to those questions. Today, we're talking to one of those people amongst a vast network of problem solvers. Daniel Ashlock is a mathematics professor at the University of Guelph. He's part of a team that's developing an AI program to help answer the looming moral and ethical questions facing the world's public health leaders. Daniel, thanks for making the time to talk to us. You're welcome. So advancements are being made in vaccine clinical trials. There are a few candidates that are in late stage trials right now, but we're at least six months away from any kind of vaccine that is a bit more widespread that public health officials would distribute to the public. What are the big questions you're asking yourself right now? Well, the big one that really worries me is how disappointed the public will be if the first several vaccines don't get all the way through stage three trials. This is pretty common and the public officials aren't really making that point very well. They're just cheerfully reporting that this vaccine is coming along. You're saying, especially in the beginning, as we're still trying to figure this out, that first batch, it may not work the way that we want it to or to the extent that we want widespread immunity, is what you're saying. Yes, and then there's two other sort of upsetting things about that. We think immunity to COVID-19 lasts, but we're not sure because the antibodies do drop off. It's just there are diseases where they do drop off and you retain the immunity in T-cells. And the other thing is the first several vaccines are types of vaccines we've never, ever tried before, ever. And these vaccines, like the RNA vaccines, can be produced a lot faster. That's why they're so far along. But we've never done a live fire test on them. So that's a little concerning, too. If they don't pass stage three trials, they'll never be deployed. There's currently a serious problem with people saying they won't take the vaccines. Now, in Canada, we're doing somewhat better, but we still have this huge flood of misinformation. If you look at the people who are reluctant to take vaccines, a lot of them say it's because Bill Gates has put microchips in the vaccines. Public health needs to do what they can. And I think their big argument is if you would like your normal life back, you're going to need to do this. And your team is thinking about how vaccines will be used, especially in a wider population. And you're thinking about how artificial intelligence, AI, plays into this. What is your team working on right now? What we're working on is an AI that will help with the dispersal of scarce vaccines. If we had enough vaccines for everybody, you would not need our AI. What we're trying to do is to figure out where the vaccines will do the most good. That's sort of the starting point. And because we're not exactly sure how to do it, we're actually implementing five different sorts of AI and comparing them. This is where that thing you said about at least six months until the vaccine helps. Um, right now, we've tested two of the ideas. Three of them are in development. Three months from now, we'll have early testing of all five ideas and know which ones we want to concentrate on. Six months from now, hopefully, we'll be able to hand tools out to public health officials and to be very clear, we're not going to hand them finished tools. We're going to hand them tools that they get to configure according to the situation on the ground where they are and their own judgments. 
what are these AI tools that you're talking about? What they do is they take a social network of who could pass the virus to who. And what it does is it simply tries to figure out which places in the social network the vaccine will stop the most infections. How is the AI going to be used by public health officials? Are you creating a framework for them? How is AI actually figuring into vaccine dispersal? How is it going to be used? Public health official would have from somewhere his contact network of people in his health area. He'd know how many doses of vaccine he had. And then the software would, after essentially taking a couple of cues from the health official, hand him a list of people that would be good to vaccinate. People who are in a high contact profession or who have a lot of contacts would be more likely to get the vaccine and so on. But what we're doing is there's a whole lot of different common sense ways of deploying a vaccine to health workers, to grocery store workers, to people with lots of contacts, to people that are vulnerable and so on. And it's really hard to tell which of these many sensible rules is the right one to use. So what our AI does is it runs the epidemic hundreds of thousands of times in simulation, testing using different rules on different days in different orders. And it comes back with the orders that reduce the number of people that ever catch the disease the most. So it's a way of sorting through the common sense techniques and finding which one is appropriate at the moment or, you know, most helpful. So if I'm understanding you correctly, that there's this framework that you're creating that public health officials can then use in their given situation, depending on where they are, how bad the outbreak is, how much vaccine they have at their disposal. Am I getting that right? That's exactly right, except for one other thing. In the grant proposal to fund graduate students, which is something a professor always would like, but we said that those graduate students will then be deployed along with the framework to places that are willing to hire them so that there will be somebody that actually understands the software helping the public health official. This is pretty important, as anybody who's ever tried to read the directions on software and failed knows. I mean, you're part of answering these pretty big questions, which is who gets the vaccine first and who gets to decide those rules? Why do you think that these are such critical questions? Well, actually, we don't get to decide that. We hand someone else who decides that a tool, and we try and make as good a tool as we can. But having said that, the questions are critical simply because it matters who gets the vaccine. And part of the problem is we're facing an ethical and philosophical issue. The testing technique we're using is prevent the most cases of disease we can. But the public health official might have a different criterion. And it's very quick to shift what our goodness criterion for our AI's performance is. At its very base, is this a morality question? How do you build in AI that can help answer a morality question? Well, the Center for Ethical AI at the University of Guelph, we've debated that a lot. And right now, mostly you can't. It's just not possible. And yet I'm very concerned about this. So the first thing we're doing is part of our testing is looking at possible scenarios where the AI does something that makes perfect sense and is obviously immoral. I'll give you an example in a minute and trying to build in checks against those. But since we're not omniscient, it's very likely an AI, which has no human sense of morality, will make recommendations that minimize the disease in substantially unacceptable fashions. And I don't mean that it finds the only way to minimize the disease. Usually you have a lot of choices and it's gonna find some that are effective and some of those may not be ethical. And so mostly that's why I want the graduate student helping the public health official. When the public health official looks at the recommendations and says, oh my God, we can't do that the graduate student can reset things and get a different set of good recommendations. Are you ready for the example? Absolutely. Bring it. So one of the things we identified is if you had a densely packed neighborhood, and these are usually poor, it would be an ineffective place to deploy the vaccine because it would be so hard to stop it there if you didn't have much vaccine. And so putting a wall of vaccines around that neighborhood would be a natural thing for the AI to come up with. But that's just awful. Right, because you're explicitly saying the people who are vulnerable, the people who are poor, they don't get the vaccines. The AI would say, vaccinate everybody else. Hang on. No, it's worse than that. 
We're not saying it explicitly. We're saying it implicitly. The AI makes a bunch of recommendations and somebody has to plot them on a map to even notice it did that. Um, there's a wonderful article in Wired Magazine where they were really worried that black people were getting much longer sentences for the same crime than white people. And so they decided to put an AI in charge of it. And what they did was they used a technique called deep learning that digested all the recent case law as examples to create an AI that could come up with sentences. And what the AI learned was black people should get sentences three times as long as white people because right. it was being trained on the case law. It had no moral sense, and the idiots just fed the flawed decisions into it as a training set. Again, it is only backed by the data that we feed it. And of course, in that sense, there are many blind spots. There are gaps in figuring out how to best use this information. Yeah, this is why I need public health officials that both have somebody that can run the software near them and are aware that the software is amoral at best. This kind of gets to the center of what I'm wondering about the AI and how public health officials can get involved, because we've seen with the pandemic that it has exposed a lot of inequalities in our society, that disproportionately the poorest people in our society face the worst consequences, the elderly population, people of color are disproportionately getting sick and they are dying from this. Can you avoid inequalities in the AI? The short answer to that is by getting the right training data. That's kind of me sweeping everything under a rug because getting the right training data is really hard. Also, I don't think the AI really has much traction to solve the problem because the problem results from systemic racism in our society. And the AI can help you with the information you have and to use it effectively, but it can't fix these weird pre-existing conditions in how we've chosen to set up society. It might be able to help a little. But again, mostly what you're going to need is for human beings who care to keep asking the AI to try again until it comes up with an acceptable solution. And the nice thing is, is it's really fast. So like I said, it can look through millions of solutions and we can, on a time scale of a few days, modify its sense of what it's trying to do so that it won't do certain things we don't want it to do. So ultimately, this information that the AI produces, it is still down to people and it's down to public health experts. It's down to officials to interpret the information that AI is giving out. Yes. Have you ever heard of the term intelligence augmentation? No, I haven't. Can you explain that? So AI is artificial intelligence. It's really a bad term because we've never succeeded in creating an artificial intelligence. What we've succeeded in creating is fairly clever algorithms that can solve problems we have trouble solving. And the basic idea is, is that instead of trying to create an inhuman intelligence, which is way too hard, what we should do is create tools that make the humans we have more intelligent, intelligence augmentation. That's how I run my own research. I work with my computer and it makes my brain more powerful, but it's still my intelligence directing the research. I just do things that startle other people because they don't know I'm getting a computer to do a lot of the hard work for me. Right. You're using this information and the AI to help support the work that you're doing. It's not the work itself. Exactly. Do you think that public health officials are asking themselves these kinds of moral, ethical questions down the line for a vaccine that doesn't exist yet? Probably not much, because right now what they're doing is scrambling to keep people alive and being hit over the head with a tsunami of chaos. I'm hoping they're thinking about it a little. And one of our goals is to make it easier for them to think about it when the issue of who gets the vaccine becomes closer to something happening. I hope the public health officials are thinking about this, but they're awful busy. Let's think about this in a hypothetical sense then, and in a hopeful sense, that let's say nine months from now, there is a stable vaccine that is fairly widely distributed. Let's say that there's a few million doses available. That's still a huge contrast to the billions of people that live in the world. But let's say that there are several million that can be deployed. How do you hope that the framework, the AI framework that your team is building, how do you hope that that can be used in figuring out how to most smartly distribute the vaccine? Anybody that wants to read our instructions, download the software, can try and run it. They have to, from somewhere, get a notion of 
who is communicating the disease to who. I'm calling that a social network. But in fact, we can work with high-level social networks, at which point our AI just generates good advice. Or if they're doing like individual tracing with cell phones, we get a low-level social network with actual people in it. And then we can say, yeah, give Fred a vaccine, give Susan a vaccine, give Janet a vaccine, and, you know, their phone number or whatever. That also is going to get into the issue of privacy, which is another giant can of worms. And so anybody that wants to download it can download it. We will have instructions on how to use it, and we will have at least a few people at first that can go help other people use it. That will probably be, you know, in Canada and, in fact, in Ontario and Nova Scotia, since Nova Scotia is funding the grant. We are also planning, if it starts to catch on, to hold training seminars so we can teach more people how to use it effectively and hopefully ethically, and it'll spread. Now, mind you, we are one poker hand in a very large Texas Hold'em game of developing software like this. I like our approach. It's very different from other people's approaches. It might or might not catch on. And just as a last question here, do you think that the questions that you're asking now and the data, the AI that you're trying to help create, do you think that this is part of the larger network of questions that we didn't even think we would have to ask ourselves, you know, six months ago that could now be used and we'll see real-time results? Okay, yes, we'll see real-time results, but no, we didn't think of this in the last six months. We thought of this eight years ago. It's just it was kind of sitting on our back burner until suddenly a need rose up and said, hey, hey, get this off the back burner. Daniel, thank you so much for taking the time. You're welcome. Thank you for having me on the show. That's Daniel Ashlock, mathematics professor at the University of Guelph. He's part of a team that's developing artificial intelligence to help public health officials make smart decisions when a vaccine arrives. And his work is like so many who are trying to find answers to COVID-19, that it's not just about the vaccine, though of course that is very important, but the many researchers around the world who are figuring out the logistics of how to tackle the pandemic. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Adrian Chung, Saba Aitazaz, and Raju Muthar. Produced and mixed by Sean Patton, and our director of programming is JP Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon.